Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. Thank you for giving us your time this evening. I'd like to warmly welcome you to pregnancy and higher BMI after bariatric surgery tonight. And we've got two wonderful presenters, Dr. Helen Wiltshire, GPLO at the PHN, and Louise Bolger, who is a dietitian, senior dietitian from Gladstone Hospital. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also let, like to let you know that we have a, a question and answer function on the right hand side of your screen. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please pop them through and we'll address them at the end. And I guess without further ado, I'll turn off my camera um, and let Helen and Louise um, continue. Thank you. Thank you and thank you, Jodie. Um, for those of you who've not met me in person, um, I'm Helen Wiltshire. And again, I'll be turning off my camera so that we can run through the slides that I've got here. I'll pop you through to my slides. So again, thank you to Jodie for the acknowledgement of country, knowing that we're meeting over probably a range of places in Queensland. If you're not aware, this is a session that will be recorded for the PHN YouTube channel. So you can access it again later or people who've not been able to attend tonight can access the information at a later time. Also at the end of the presentation, there's an evaluation function and we'd really encourage you to fill that out straight away and give us some feedback. Webinars are still a fairly new format for me. So I really appreciate any um, helpful comments. So we can make this a really useful format while we can't meet face to face. A little bit more about me, I'm the GP Liaison Officer for Maternity Services for the CQ Wide Bay and Sunshine Coast PHN and that's really with a focus on antenatal shared care in the Rockhampton area. Other disclosures and potential conflict of interest, uh, I have my clinical work at True Relationships and Reproductive Health Clinic in Rockhampton. I do some teaching for GP registrars, medical students and the FPAA clinical attachments and I've also received some support from Bayer and MSD for their product education events and meetings. And as I prepared this workshop, um, it was under the title of obesity in pregnancy. And then I felt it was probably more appropriate to change those terms to pregnancy at higher BMI. Um, I, I'm just gonna do about a 10 minute overview about some of the concerns for people at higher BMI and pregnancy. And then Louise will give an update in her area of special interest about more detailed management after people have had bariatric surgery and then following that with pregnancy. Heaps of resources as always. The Australian Pregnancy Care Guidelines and Queensland Health Clinical Guidelines are really useful. For those of you doing shared care, if you don't have local information, then the Mater Mothers is a really great Queensland resource. If you're in central Queensland, uh, providing early pregnancy care or shared antenatal care, this is the CQ shortcut reference. If we haven't already sent you a copy or you don't have a printed copy, then you can access this through the CQ Health Pathways page and it's the CQ summary. I know you can't see much on the slide, but it tells you what to do at each stage of pregnancy, particularly around shared care. The information for my summary today um, has come through mainly the RANSCOG current ONG magazine with its article about managing pregnancies complicated by obesity and RACGP seminar, which was around management of pregnant women with obesity. And of course, there's lots of information both on the RANSCOG and RACGP websites. As you know, the Australian population is getting heavier overall and about 45% of women giving birth have a BMI in the overweight or obese range. It's true that almost all adverse outcomes of pregnancy are overrepresented in the overweight or obese women. And this includes things like preeclampsia, fetal malformations, DVTs, babies that are small for gestational age or large for gestational age. Um, rates of stillbirth are higher 
and wound infections after caesarean or operative delivery are also higher. Even getting pregnant can be an issue for women who have a higher BMI. Uh, as you know, that increased weight can have an effect on ovulation, so they may be ovulating irregularly. And even if they are ovulating, it can take longer to get pregnant. There are those increased maternal and fetal risks for all stages of pregnancy. And we're also realising more and more about the epigenetic and generational consequences of overweight, knowing that excessive maternal weight gain affects baby's metabolism. There are higher rates uh, in these babies for childhood obesity and diabetes, and an increased risk of obesity and diabetes as teenagers. However, we don't have really good high level evidence about what to do. Most of the recommendations from RANSCOG come through as consensus based. So just for example, in studies that look at weight loss uh, as an intervention factor are not necessarily comparing this to people who eat more nutritious food and move their bodies more. So it may not be the weight loss itself that is actually the factor improving their health. Your approach in talking to your patients will differ depending on when you're seeing them in pregnancy uh, and your role in caring for her, her or her baby and family. But people know that they're overweight and it's important to be pragmatic but sensitive and really avoid being judgmental or body shaming. The Queensland Clinical Guidelines, again, have got a really great chart summary. This is attached in the handout section uh, from um, the resources tonight. So this is the online version, which of course is the most up to date and it's under review for the end of this year. It's a brief run through you know, all the stages of pregnancy. So for me, quickly running through things to think about in each stage of pregnancy. So an initial BMI might be helpful. Uh, if women don't want to know exactly what their weight is, they don't, you know, you can turn them around on the scales or cover the numbers so that it's just recorded somewhere privately that they don't need to know. But an initial BMI might be helpful, particularly if you've got a regional hospital that has BMI limitations for safe care. Talk about those limitations early so people don't get a shock late in their pregnancy. Talk about healthy eating and exercise, finding an activity that people enjoy. It, it is good for everyone, you know, we know that, but it's always good to hear it again from a health professional. And overweight women should have a higher dose of folic acid, so five milligrams daily, ideally for a month before conception, up through to 12 weeks. Checking some additional blood tests at their first visit, so a GTT or currently recommendation an HbA1c instead liver and kidney function, and looking at urine protein creatinine ratio. If they're electing to have an NIPT to look at the risk of chromosomal abnormalities, do be aware that there's an increased chance of getting uh, a no result or a failed test on these due to a low fetal fraction of DNA um, in the maternal circulation. And also consider aspirin or calcium, um, to reduce the risk of preeclampsia. So aspirin would be 100 milligrams at night, starting before 16 weeks, and calcium if their dietary intake is low, uh, 1.5 to 2 grams per day. Later in pregnancy, the routine in an 18 to 20 week scan can be difficult technically. Uh, it's less likely to show up significant abnormalities and these may only be discovered at the time of birth. Some repeated tests for proteinuria are important. There's an increased chance of bacteria and UTI occurring. And it seems that the, under, um, the growth restriction or undetected growth restriction is the likely cause of the increased stillbirth risk. And the obesity and insulin resistance affect the placental function, particularly in the last weeks of pregnancy. And presentations for decreased fetal movement seem to be more common amongst women of that higher BMI. So they do need a thorough assessment whenever they're presenting. At the time of delivery, GPs you know, probably not generally involved in the intrapartum care, but it can be helpful to know um, some information to help facilitate patient decision making. So when people have a BMI over 40, the caesarean section, emergency caesarean section rate 
can increase to about 40 percent and so a balance of risks might favour women being induced or having an elective caesarean. Fetal monitoring can be more difficult, can be hard to get a trace, so invasive monitoring like fetal scalp electrodes are more likely to be used and the difficulties with those. If a baby's born and their growth restriction has been undetected, that can cause some issues for the baby at birth and there's an increased risk of postpartum haemorrhage. After birth, keep in mind that there's that increased risk of wound infection, so watching for that. Women who are overweight are less likely to initiate breastfeeding and seem to have some delays in their milk coming in um, and establishing lactation. So really getting in early, starting in pregnancy, talking about breastfeeding and providing the additional support that may be needed. With obesity being an independent risk factor for VTE, um, consider prophylaxis. And this might be um, you know, 10 days of prophylaxis if there's just one other risk factor or for six weeks if they've got three or more risk factors and there's some good charts available to assess that um, like better safer care from Victorian Department of Health. And of course if women have had gestational diabetes as part of their pregnancy then repeating um, their GTT at some later stage. Six to 12 weeks has been the standard but that can be delayed now um, if there's concerns around infection and COVID risk in the community. And thinking about things in between babies or between pregnancies, again, encouraging that healthy lifestyle. So eating nutritious food that's going to work for their bodies and finding an activity that they enjoy. If people are losing weight, then aiming to stabilise that weight loss um, before they next conceive. It seems counterintuitive, but malnutrition can still occur in people who are overweight. Um, and they is of course a high incidence of eating disorders either currently um, or in the past. So what might people find helpful? Really a focus on health rather than weight. Be honest about the extra tests that may be needed and talk about why you're doing them, that there are some increased risks but you're aiming to detect those factors and treat things early to prevent adverse outcomes. If you're needing to monitor weight, uh, consider recording that in a way that just the healthcare worker can see. And it's true that people in larger bodies do face stigma and discrimination. Um, there are many factors involved in overweight and it's often not a very modifiable risk factor. So being sensitive um, and understanding of, about people's challenges, I think, is really important. So that brings me to the end of my very quick run through of um, some of the concerns around pregnancy at high BMI. And what I'd like to do then is to pass over to Louise. I'll flick through the slides for her, but I'll hand over to her for her presentation. Thanks, Helen. So I'll just, um, or actually I'm, I'll do an intro and I'll leave the camera on for the moment. So I became interested in bariatric surgery uh, when I worked in the UK, which was over about 10 years ago. In the UK, bariatric surgery is available on the NHS. So I worked in a clinic there and I found it, it was just fascinating. I, I loved the area. And um, then more so recently, the last few years I've, had to become more skilled in it again because we have so many women that are presenting now um, becoming pregnant, planned or not, after having bariatric surgery. So it's an area that we're doing a lot more work in at, at the hospital, especially at Gladstone. So a lot more upskilling of midwives and obstetricians. Next slide, please. Thanks. So last year, Helen presented uh, a talk, the same talk that I had done, but it was a little bit different. I've updated it because since then, these consensus recommendations have been released. So throughout my talk, if there's a section that's coloured green, that's a direct recommendation from this paper. Next, please. So I'll just briefly touch on the different types of surgery. 
Um, there, there's many types, but the three main types that you will come across are the two restrictive procedures are gastric banding and sleeve gastrectomy. So sleeve is probably the most common procedure that we see at the moment. I haven't seen anyone with a band who's become pregnant probably in about two years. The majority of all of our patients are having a sleeve. Um, and I think that's because they can access, there's a, a doctor down on the Gold Coast who does it quite cost effectively. And so a lot of our ladies are going down there. Uh, another common procedure is the gastric bypass, or it's also called the Ruan Y bypass. Um, it's not as popular now because it's malabsorptive and restrictive. So as you can see from the picture here, what happens is that um, the majority of the stomach is not in use. So what you're left with your stomach size is about the size of a shot glass. And then the first 100 to 120 centimetres of the bowel, which is a duodenum, is bypassed. So that's why we call it malabsorptive. Whereas with the sleeve, um, the benefit is that you have a smaller stomach, um, but you don't have, nothing in your bowel area is rearranged, so to speak. So you, you have about, your stomach volume reduces by about 75%. The other benefit with the sleeve is that the ghrelin producing um, endocrine cells, which sort of sit in that top pocket on the left of the stomach, are not in use anymore. So that a, um, helps to aid appetite regulation a bit better and um, insulin metabolism as well. Um, and with the band, the band, you can see there's an access port. So fluid can be injected or withdrawn out of the band. Uh, in my experience, I most people I meet with a band have some issue with it at some point. They feel a tightness in that area or they find it hard to progress from um, puree food to more solid food. So I, in, in my experience as a dietitian, I find that the people that have the best outcomes in terms of getting back to normal eating are the people with a sleeve. Next slide, thanks. So I just put a slide in here about contraception because the amount of ladies that I have met recently that have said to me or that when they've come to see me and they're pregnant and they've said, oh, I wasn't planning on getting pregnant. I already have three children or I already have um, teenagers. So under, I don't know how well it's discussed with the ladies when they do have the surgery with that their surgeon says to them, you're going to have, you, there's very high chance that you're going to have much um, improved fertility, um, especially if they have something along the lines of metabolic syndrome or um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, there's also uh, after the, um, surgery, especially with the gastric bypass, there's a much higher risk of oral contraceptive failure because the estrogen component of the contraception is metabolised in the gut wall. And if you have a, um, a shorter gut wall, then that's going to impact on that. Um, another point as well is the contraceptive diaphragm may not be as reliable and I think it's recommended, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's recommended that it gets refitted after you've lost every say three to five kilos. So for someone that's had bariatric surgery, you may be losing three or four kilos a week. So you do go through a, a period of rapid weight loss in the first few months. Next slide, thanks. So preconception advice, as I mentioned before, you're having rapid weight loss in the first 12 months. Um, some women lose up to 50% of their body weight. We definitely recommend that you wait at least 12 um, even and 24 months, if that's possible, before becoming pregnant. We really need your weight loss to be, have stabilised and basically not losing any significant amounts of weight by the time you become pregnant. And also, knowing what your um, nutrient blood levels are so that we can adjust those if needed coming into pregnancy. Next slide, thanks. So pregnant women who've previously undergone bariatric surgery have up to about a 23% 
increased risk of having a small for gestational age baby. Um, that's probably the greatest thing that we're looking at is how the growth of the baby is and then also what levels of the nutrients are low and what impact that they could possibly have on the developing um, baby as well. There's still inconclusive evidence regarding stillbirth and neonatal death. Next slide, thanks. So post-op considerations. So after surgery, one of the most, the, probably the most popular, or I shouldn't say popular, but the most common um, complication we see is dumping syndrome. So you can have early dumping syndrome or late dumping syndrome. And that is where the food leaves the stomach quicker and rushes into the bowel. And it causes symptoms similar to hypoglycemia. So you might get sweating, dizziness, diarrhea. Um, it's not, this dumping syndrome is not likely to happen in a gastric band. And it's more common in definitely in bypass because in a bypass, you no longer have your um, pyloric valve or sphincter, which is controlling when the food leaves the stomach going into the bowel because that area of your stomach and bowel is no longer in use. Um, it's not as common in a sleeve because you do have um, that sphincter still working. However, the normal, the way that a food goes into the stomach is it goes down your esophagus into the stomach and then it goes in a bit of a circular motion. It's not going to do that if you think of the amount of the stomach in a sleeve that's been removed. The food really goes in and then it sort of heads downwards. So the main recommendations to avoid dumping syndrome is avoiding having food um, and fluid together. So try and have your fluid before, say 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after a meal. And we want to slow the gastric transit time basically. Um, alcohol can also increase the likelihood of dumping. And we want you to eat very slowly and chew really well. Um, the other obvious treatments as well is reducing the amount of really sugary foods in your diet and, low G and eating low GI carbs. So avoiding high GI carbs or glycemic index carbs, which are things like white bread, um, white rice and white potato, and then obviously all your sugary things as well. Um, I had a lady who I saw about 12 months ago. It, this lady wasn't pregnant, but I saw her because she had dumping syndrome. She'd had a gastric bypass and she was having dumping syndrome after she'd been eating low fat fruit yogurt. So it was just a generic type yogurt. It wasn't one of the newer, fancier high protein ones. So it wasn't like um, Chobani or Fit Pro or any of those. And when I was looking at what the yogurt was quite high in sugar and it was low fat. So it was basically a meal of just carbs and she was experiencing dumping syndrome after that. So we recommend that when you do eat carbs, try and eat them with some fat and protein as well because the fat and protein helps the food stay in the stomach longer and that will slow the transit time as well so reducing your risk of dumping syndrome. All right, next slide thanks. So the most common nutri nutrient deficiencies that we see is um, iron and B12. Uh, some ladies also experience um, folate and now we are also seeing vitamin A deficiency, but I'm guessing maybe that's just because we are now looking for it. In the past, we would never have thought to check someone's vitamin A levels, but now we do and so we are seeing it crop up a bit. Um, I have never met someone who, who's had bariatric surgery that does not have a deficiency in some nutrient. So it is extremely common that um, anyone that's had bariatric surgery has a deficiency and definitely uh, those deficiencies are a lot more prevalent after a gastric bypass. So if we go to the next slide, thanks. Okay, so the table that I bring up next is directly out of the Queensland Maternity and Neonatal um, Guidelines. It recommends different levels of different nutrients that should be obtained through the diet and supplements. So it's not um, 
this isn't recommendations of what should be in the supplements, it's just what we need overall from an intake. Um, if you go to the next slide, thanks. We can see that first um, area that I've circled. Um, we do refer to a gastric sleeve as just a restrictive um, procedure, meaning that your, um, the amount of food going in is less. However, there is some degree of malabsorption and that's because you have, you're producing less gastric acids and less intrinsic factor. So those um, acids and intrinsic factor help to digest the food and make the nutrients in that food available. So to some degree, a gastric sleeve still is malabsorptive, even though we wouldn't classify it as. Uh, and this is why for someone that's had a gastric sleeve, we still do recommend supplementation. Even though after 12 months, they may be back to eating um, regular textured food and they may, may be eating, say, the equivalent of an entree size plate meal and snacks, which is adequate amount of food, they may not be absorbing the nutrients in that food as well. So we do still recommend that they have supplementation. Next slide, thanks. So this table is taken from the study that I mentioned before, and this is actually what's recommended in terms of supplementation. So there is quite a lot of nutrients <laughs> that are needed to be supplemented. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So in this slide here, I've included two common pregnancy multivitamins, Elephant and Blackmores, and then also the last one is BN um, Chews. Now this is a common multivitamin that um, anyone may take after they've had bariatric surgery. It has certain nutrients in higher doses. So some people still, or some women, still may be taking this once they become pregnant. The areas shaded in green means that those nutrients are meeting the recommendations from the previous slide that I mentioned about um, according to the um, guidelines on what we need in terms of supplementation. Um, so you can see that there's no one uh, multivitamin that fits everything. Um, when we now recommend that women who are pregnant should have some vitamin A, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, but it should be more in the form of beta carotene. The only pregnancy multivitamin at the moment in terms of the um, major popular ones that does have some form of vitamin A is the Blackmore's um, Gold, which is listed there. There are other pregnancy multivitamins that aren't as common that do contain vitamin A as well, but they're probably, they're not as, um, you probably have to buy them on the internet. They're quite a bit more expensive. Um, so in terms of, if, if I saw someone, um, I would be looking at what their blood levels show, but um, generally we recommend that a lady has, when they're pregnant that, um, and had bariatric surgery, that they're taking a pregnancy multivitamin, that they possibly may also need iron and B12 depending on their blood levels, and then that also would, depending on what their blood levels are and what, how far along they are in their pregnancy, whether they need um, B12 IM and maybe an iron infusion. If those levels were quite low in their last trimester, I would be looking more towards um, definitely IM for the um, B12. The oral supplements don't seem to work as well and as quick. So pregnancy multivitamin, possibly iron and B12, um, likely vitamin D and likely calcium as well, depending on what their dietary intake is. And then depending on what their blood levels show, they may need um, extra um, supplementation as well. Next slide, thanks. So I thought I would just talk a little bit about vitamin A. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about it. So vitamin A, it's a group of fat soluble retinoids. Um, the two most common is retinol, which is called preformed vitamin A. And then the other form, common form is pro-vitamin A, which is also called carotenoids or beta carotene. So the retinol form, um, most common sources are 
liver or organ meats and eggs. And then your pro vitamin A, your beta carotene is coming from your orange coloured uh, vegetables, but also um, dark leafy greens as well. And also things like broccoli. Uh, so both have a really important function in the body. Probably um, the most common is that, that we would know about is um, if a someone is low in vitamin A, they, then they have an increased risk of night blindness. Next slide, thanks. So we know that the retinol form of vitamin A in high doses is tetragenic, meaning that it can be potentially damaging to the um, developing fetus. And that is within the um, first few weeks of pregnancy. So in the USA and Canada, they have an upper limit for retinol um, during pregnancy, and that's around 10,000 IU a day. Uh, that's roughly the same in Australia. Uh, we know that the safer form of vitamin A, the beta carotene, is safe to take during pregnancy. And that's why any of those pregnancy multivitamins will contain the beta carotene form. So interestingly, in the USA and Canada, they suggest that pregnant women limit their consumption of liver and organ meats in the first trimester, but they said it's safe to consume it after the first trimester. So that is a lot different to what the recommendations are in Australia. Uh, in Australia, they recommend that you should not have any um, liver or organ meat at all. So I don't know where we're progressing, but there is a lot of discussion going on amongst health professionals and dietitians that maybe we need to um, be a bit leaning towards allowing a little bit of um, organ meats later in pregnancy so that women are getting those um, that retinol form of vitamin A, which is more readily used in the body. Our body can convert beta carotene to retinol, but it's not as effective. Um, I don't know how many women would feel about consuming organ meats in pregnancy anyway, so they may not wish to do that. Um, the World Health Organization also has recommendations if someone has a vitamin A deficiency of what is a safe level to supplement with in pregnancy. Next slide, thanks. So micronutrient monitoring. So all these recommendations here are taken from the study. Um, Pre-pregnancy planning, we would definitely want to know folate, B12, ferritin, iron, full blood count, vitamin A. And then there's a few other um, bloods that are listed there as well every six months. Uh, another thing that I would also recommend women have checked, which is not uh, mentioned in those consensus guidelines, was that probably every 18 months to two years is that they have a bone density test. So there has been some links to of bariatric surgery to um, reduce bone density. So that's something that we want to keep an eye on. So once a lady becomes pregnant, then we definitely want to be checking each trimester those nutrients um, listed there. And then there are some others that we would check as well in the first trimester. Um, I had a discussion with a doctor at the hospital, an obstetrician the other day, and they said to me, there is a lot of um, things here that we're checking and this is going to cost, uh, or they were concerned about the cost to the health service for all of these blood tests. And I completely understand that. Um, but then I guess I looked at it from a different point of view and also from um, experience that I'd had with a patient a few years ago where these levels weren't monitored very well. Um, the lady also had severe hyperemesis um, and her baby was born small for gestational age, but then also there were certain areas um, or organs that weren't developed as well as they should have been. Also, now that I'm thinking that child is around, say, 18 months, two years old, that child has been accessing the child development service. So they've been seeing dietetics for growth and nutrient monitoring. They've been seeing OT for um, development, they've been seeing physio, they've been seeing speech. So I'm thinking of the cost of accessing all of those services down the track, whereas I don't know if we could have prevented 
those things happening, but also but looking or checking on those bloods early on may have an impact, may have an impacted on that. Yeah, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, next one, please. So I thought I should at least put a, a slide in about food. Um, so when I see a lady who is pregnant, um, has had bariatric surgery, what I'm usually talking about with her is making sure that she's getting adequate nutrition, so especially protein. So aiming to get in at least 60 grams of protein a day is actually takes quite a bit of planning. Um, a, if you think of a piece of, you know those uh, rectangle pieces of salmon that you can buy at the supermarket? So one of those pieces of salmon may only have, say, around 20 grams of protein or so. So if you think about we need, these ladies need to get in 60, that's a lot of planning. So a few of the pictures here I've put of foods which are higher in protein. So eggs are exceptionally good in pregnancy. They also contain a, a nutrient called choline, which is a bit like, um, acts a bit like folate. Um, I put their uh, tin salmon. The salmon is especially good, especially if they eat the bones because there's calcium in the bones as well. Um, rissoles, beef or lamb rissoles because red meat is your best source of iron. And if possible, I try and get these ladies eating red meat at least three times a week. And it doesn't have to be in a meal. They could have a small um, risole or beef patty as a morning tea or a snack. Um, I've got also their yogurt. And I normally encourage um, just full fat Greek yogurt or one of the higher protein yogurts. Um, often with the, especially with the cheaper brands, the low fat yogurts will have quite a bit of sugar added into them. So if, we're aim, so if we want to aim more for those lower sugar products to avoid the risk of dumping syndrome, then a bit of fat is okay. Um, and also you might want to mix in with it some nuts or if you see that picture there, LSA. So LSA is ground up linseed sunflower almonds. So good for fiber, good for protein, good for good fats as well, and the other um, nutrients that are found in nuts and seeds too. Uh, so this bread is uh, a bread that you can buy at Eldi. It is quite a good source of protein. So I think two slices is around 18 or 19 grams of protein for the two slices, which is really good. And then I also put a picture of roasted chickpeas, which you can get in little packets. So they're a good protein snack as well. Uh, next slide, thanks. Okay, so in terms of looking, what are we looking at when a um, you see a pregnant woman that's had bariatric surgery? Um, so just be very mindful of um, morning sickness or worst case scenario, hyperemesis. Um, the, if she has really severe vomiting and that lady has a gastric band, I'd say likely that the band, the fluid in the band will need to be removed and it'll need to be deflated. Um, intestinal obstruction also can be a complication and it can just present as um, usual pregnancy complaints as well. Uh, we do recommend an, another routine fetal ultrasound at, at 28 to 32 weeks. And I'd be probably inclined to say preferable at 28 weeks um, because if we identify anything, especially to do with the growth of the baby, then we have a little bit extra time to investigate that, um, especially if there's um, micronutrients that need to be adjusted in the diet or supplements. And next slide, thanks. So I get often get asked quite a bit about gestational diabetes and bariatric surgery. Unfortunately, there are no guidelines for how do we screen gestational diabetes in women who have had bariatric surgery. There are only recommendations and many centres will um, follow their own local policies as well. To truly diagnose with someone with gestational diabetes, we require a oral glucose tolerance test. However, we know, next slide, thanks, that 
a OGTT is contraindicated in bariatric surgery. Uh, if someone has had a lap band, they may be able to sit a glucose tolerance test if they can tolerate 300 mils of the solution in 10 minutes. However, um, we know now that Pathology Queensland, so I'm not sure about the ind independent pathology centres, but I know the pathology that um, run through Queensland Health do not allow anyone that has had bariatric surgery to sit a glucose tolerance test at all. So what is being uh, recommended at the moment is that those women are then um, referred back to the midwife and then they're referred to the diabetes educator. So the reason why we don't recommend a glucose tolerance test definitely in someone that's had a gastric bypass or a sleeve is that it is, it's 75 grams of sugar, so it's pure glucose, and that will definitely cause dumping syndrome because of the high, with the high glucose load and the osmolality. And if it's causing dumping syndrome, the sugar is rushing into the bowel quicker, so it's not going to give an accurate blood glucose result anyway. Next slide, thanks. So in terms of being able to diagnose these ladies, well, what we're recommending is that if these ladies are high risk, that they have a HbA1c in the first trimester. So that if it's above 5.9%, that's indicative of GDM risk, but it's not a diagnosis. And as the pregnancy goes further along, the HbA1c becomes um, less reliable because there's a more, a more rapid turnover in blood cells. We know that blood glucose levels sit much lower in pregnancy. So fasting levels, a normal fasting should be between say 3.5 and 4.4, and two hours postprandial, 4.9 to 6.1. So they are much lower levels than say someone that has, um, than what we're looking at for say type two diabetes. And if you've ever seen a um, continuous glucose monitor trace or blood glucose trace for someone that um, is pregnant, their blood glucose line or their, um, their trace sits very flat. There shouldn't be a lot of fluctuations in the blood glucose levels for a pregnant woman. Uh, if someone, if a lady has a high HbA1c in the first eight weeks, I would be um, most likely thinking that possibly that lady had type two diabetes um, before she became pregnant. We can't say that for certain because she is pregnant, but given that the blood glucose levels sit much lower in pregnancy, it would be unlikely um, that she would have GDM. It would possibly be type two diabetes. Um, the blood glucose, one of the theories behind why the blood glucose sits so much lower in pregnancy is because the body is using that glucose to um, build the placenta. So, it's used so the sugar's sitting lower and the body's using it to build the placenta. And that could also possibly be a reason why women crave carbohydrate foods in their first trimester. So chips and potato and bread and those starchy things. And it's possibly because they're getting the glucose from those foods to just top up their blood sugar levels a little bit. So at Gladstone Hospital, we recommend that the ladies check their blood sugar four times a day. So the same as if someone was already diagnosed for gestational diabetes. So that's first thing in the morning when they wake up and then two hours after breakfast, lunch and dinner. And we recommend they do that for around a week at 28 weeks. And depending on what their levels show, so if their levels are quite high, especially the fasting levels, we may just diagnose them as gestational diabetes at that point. If the blood sugar looks okay, then we do get them to test again at 32 weeks. And if we go to the next slide, thanks. And that is because what we have found, especially at our centre, from some of the stats we've been keeping, is the majority of our ladies that end up on, up on some type of treatment, so if it's metformin or insulin, they're normally starting that at around between, say, 30 to 32 weeks. So we're still 
seeing a bit of a spike around that time. So many women at 28 weeks, their blood sugar uh, might be fine for a number of weeks, but then it seems to have a little bit of a creep up at around 32 weeks. So we are getting them to do that extra week of testing. Whereas a lot of other centres will just get them to do one week of testing at say around 28 weeks. Next slide, thanks. Our challenge with giving the ladies or getting the ladies to do the testing themselves is that if we don't have a definite diagnosis, we can't sign an NDSS form and then they are unable to access their strips subsidised. So to go to the chemist and buy a box of strips, say a one, box of 100 strips, without an NDSS card is possibly 70 or $80. Uh, if you have an NDSS card, then it's roughly around $15 or even cheaper if you have a concession card. So this, this is a bit of a work in progress at the moment, this issue. Uh, what we're doing is that we get provided the meters from some of the meter companies um, for free and they normally provide us with a box of about 10 strips. So we provide that box of 10 and they do their testing for the first week and then we go from there and see if we can give them another box if they need to do further testing at say around 32 weeks. Next slide, thanks. So I thought I would mention about ketones in pregnancy because I often get asked questions, um, especially from midwives or sometimes we even get referrals for a woman that has had, um, this is say in, even in the non-bariatric population, for women that have had ketones in their pregnancy. So the main thing we need to look at is where what has caused those ketones or what, what is the background factors. So DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, which is most commonly seen in type 1 diabetes, um, definitely is a high risk. Uh, the blood sugar would be very high in this case, above 15. We know it's harmful to the developing baby because of the um, acidic state of the body. I have never actually come across a lady that has had DKA in GDM. Um, from what I have, I have asked a few um, obstetricians and endocrinologists about this and they said it's extremely rare. It's not something you would commonly see. Uh, and it's normally the DKA presents because the blood sh sugar is sitting so high because there's a lack of insulin in the body. Even in GDM, true GDM, if the blood sugar is sitting higher, that mother will still be producing some insulin. So DKA is very rare. Uh, the next type of um, or situation that could lead to ketones is uh, is someone's starving. So say for example, if they have hyperemesis. So the ketones are being produced because the body is breaking down fat and that it, the ketones are the byproduct. So in this case, um, if they're producing ketones because they're starving, we need to look at well, what, where, how do we get some calories and nutrition into this person um, to reduce the level of ketones. Um, and we have, there has been some ladies that we've had to do nasogastric feeding for um, in cases of hyperemesis to help um, get nutrition back into their bodies and reduce the amount of ketones. So the third category is what we call nutritional ketosis. So this state would occur when uh, the blood sugar is at an adequate level, but the mother is consuming a more on the lower side of uh, carbohydrates, so more a low carb diet, and they're eating adequate amount of calories, but it's mostly going to come from fat and protein. This is the state that you may see some of your uh, some of the ladies that have had bariatric surgery because they're so used to having protein drummed into their head to eat it that they're not eating as much carbs or they just don't really have the room for it. As long as uh, these ladies are eating regularly and they're eating protein and fat and some carbs, then I'm not, normally not too concerned about the ketone level because they are burning a bit of um, fat and that's why they're having the ketones. So this is what we would call nutritional ketosis. We go to the next slide, thanks. 
So the first section of this picture is what a urine strip might look like. And then I have put that at the bottom, what that translates to in terms of um, the millimole levels. So you can see that the, the first few shades of purple or pink are not levels that um, of ketones that I would be concerned about. Um, and also to highlight as well that urine ketones are nowhere near as accurate as blood ketones. And blood ketone levels are not directly the same as urine ketone levels. So if someone's um, blood ketone levels are over 1.5 millimoles, that's too high, that's potentially too dangerous. We wouldn't normally see that level in someone that's sitting in, say, the nutritional ketosis. It, those levels would normally be under, say, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 for blood ketone levels. Uh, next slide, thanks. So breastfeeding. Um, bariatric surgery is not a contraindication to breastfeeding. However, uh, many women, as Helen briefly touched on before, many women struggle to maintain their supply. Uh, it is very common for um, especially women who've had bariatric surgery to not be able to drink even a litre a day. And with breastfeeding, you need to be drinking at least two and a half litres. So fitting in that fluid in between food is very difficult. And it even gets to the point where I talk about with the ladies, okay, you need to put a reminder on your phone or an alarm or something to go off to remind you to have sips of water and to have, say, one or two drink bottles that have measurements on them so that the ladies know or are able to keep an eye on how much um, fluid they're actually getting through in a day. So we don't recommend a ketogenic diet whilst breastfeeding. A ketogenic diet is where they're taking in less than 30 grams of carbs a day. Many ladies have followed a ketogenic diet after they've had bariatric surgery to aid with more of the weight loss. Um, you do need a certain amount of carbohydrate and glucose in your blood to aid the production of the breast milk and to keep your blood glucose levels at a stable level. So you can see the pictures below that I've put there. It's quite easy to get at least 30 grams of carbs a day. Two pieces of fruit or a potato and one slice of bread are going to get you to 30 grams. Um, so yeah, the next slide here, yeah, that uh, we need at least 50 grams of carbs a day. Okay, so as a GP, what can you do? Uh, please, before the lady um, becomes pregnant, please talk about contraception and please highlight that increased um, likelihood or increased fertility once they've had bariatric surgery. Um, so the next point here, request a CAT1 booking for the antenatal clinic. If the lady does not want to go to, or wants to do shared care, or wants to go through the antenatal, uh, or wants to remain with the GP, that's completely their choice, that's okay. However, then I would still try and link them in with the dietitian early on, and possibly even communicate to the antenatal clinic and say, oh look, I have a patient, uh, a lady who's become pregnant, she's had bariatric surgery, could we link in with your dietitian and then when the lady would like to be able to access the antenatal clinic, um, we can um, provide the shared care. Um, if, yes, so I've just touched on that one about um, the dietitian. We do recommend an additional ultrasound at um, 28 to 32 weeks. Please check their vitamin and mineral um, nutrient levels before becoming pregnant and each trimester. And those levels that we would like to be checked are highlighted um, earlier in the slides. Uh, there is a, in that study that I talked about earlier, or sorry, the consensus recommendations, there's a really good table of what should be checked. And it also mentions as well what nutrient levels need to be checked when the mother is breastfeeding too. And lastly, um, always check and ask if the ladies are taking their supplements. Up, the statistics show up to 50% of women don't. I would think that that's even up to, in my experience, 80 or 90%, um, especially uh, supplements like calcium, which are big chunky ones. So I find that pretty common that they're 
not taking all of them or maybe only taking one of them. All right, ne uh, the next slide is just my uh, references. Let's put my camera back on. <laughs> Thanks. And I'll join you on camera too. Um, thanks so much, Louise. That's a really thorough overview of all those increased requirements for women after bariatric surgery. Um, really appreciate that. There is a lot to think about and a lot to remember. Yeah. And I, I think there probably hasn't been a huge awareness from women, you know, potentially even when they're having their surgery with the intention of getting pregnant, with the intention of improving their fertility. The women I've seen don't seem to have had a, a real grasp of um, the more intensive monitoring and screening that we would be recommending for them once they do get pregnant. Yeah, I um, I had a lady, well, well, a lady that we used to see who had gestational diabetes last year. Um, I found out that she was pregnant again and she had had bariatric surgery in December. And so not even 12 months. And I emailed her and I said, oh, hi, um, do you think you could give us a call and we can have a chat and we can book an appointment? And then she wrote back saying, oh, but I've lost 40 kilos. I'm not going to have GDM. I don't need to worry about seeing you. So oh. I was like, well, actually, it's not so much about the GDM. It's more about I want to check those nutrient levels in your blood and make sure your baby's growing as well as we want it to. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, um, Jody, I'm wondering if we've had any questions come through on the chat function for either of us. Um, thank you both. No, we haven't. Everyone's been very shy tonight, so I've just sent you all a message to encourage you to ask a question. Um, so I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, yeah. but, uh, thank you, Louise and Helen. Great presentations and really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. If, um, if you're happy, I'll make a comment. That's where my clinical work lies chiefly. And I, I thought I'd comment about the use of a diaphragm for contraception. And the update there is that there's now a one size fits most diaphragm that's branded as a CAYA. Um, so that's designed to fit most people who would have had between a 60 and 80 millimetre size diaphragm before. So it, it might still be um, a reasonable choice for people. Yeah. Obviously, no hormones under the woman's control. Um, you know, she's able to use that when she needs to. Um, it's designed to be used with a, a buffer, acidity buffer gel as well. Um, but it is probably potentially easy to access uh, you know, a simple online search for, you know, buy Kaya <laughs> will take you to a website where people can purchase it. So again, worth asking people what they're doing about contraception um, because they won't have always seen a doctor to access that. Thanks, Helen. Um, we still don't have any questions. So um, unless uh, someone wants to quickly send one through now, we're probably just about ready to end the webinar. <laughs> I've got a little red circle, like a little red kind of a speech bubble with some dots in it flashing. Is that an indication that oh, I've got it? Hang on. No, that might have been your message, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think your... that was my message. It's a video question. question. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. If yeah. anyone wants to follow up with questions afterwards, you can certainly send them through after the webinar on your evaluation. Um, and just a reminder that this webinar too is recorded. So if you want to play it back and have another look or share it with colleagues, you can do that as well. Is there any last comments that Louise or Helen would like to make before we finish up? Well, I've got another question to ask Louise if there's nothing coming through typed. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and that I think relates back to your comment around the vitamin A and people um, eating liver or organ meats. Mm. And I was wondering whether you find that something that people are, um, you know, are actually 
doing. It's not something that I've got much experience with, whether people are, I guess maybe those ones who are following um, a high protein diet or a, um, you know, the paleo style diet, is that something where people might have a higher intake of those kinds of meals? Um, I have, I haven't really met anyone in this population. So the, the ladies that are pregnant who have had bariatric surgery that are eating organ meats. Um, mm. But I, ha I definitely have met more, so I'm thinking about people that aren't pregnant that are yeah, following um, more low carb diets or paleo style eating that are eating more of those organ meats now because they're such a rich source of nutrients. Mm. If we can get past the, some of the, the strong taste and the smell, they're actually a really good thing to include in our diet. Um, I don't know how well someone would want to eat it when they're pregnant though. Mm. <laughs> that could be a challenge. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, I still haven't received any questions, so we're probably just about at the end. <laughs> Thank you again, Jodie, for facilitating the uh, IT and, and webinar side of things. I really appreciate that. And again, no huge thanks to Louise for sharing your knowledge and expertise. You're welcome. Certainly yeah. appreciate that. It's, um, <laughs> that's a yeah. new format for all of us and um, taking time, you know, outside a normal work day to present um, for our webinar. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for attending tonight. As I said, there'll be a recording that will be sent to you and please don't forget to fill out your evaluation. And we'll see you later. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jodie. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. I'll turn myself off.